Y'all just kind of feel this for a minute. Think, just kind of think of for a moment about this forever. We're talking about heaven today. I've been looking forward to this one because it's really exciting to talk about heaven because we've all kind of got this idea of what heaven's going to be like and God just kind of wanted to show it to you. <laughs> you know, I mean, here we are because we know that in heaven we're going to sit on a, like a big white puffy cloud like this. We're going to get to wear white robes like this. And, huh? One of these for everybody. And there's going to be singing. And there's going to be a, a choir around us. And there are going to be bright white lights surrounding us. And this is going to go on and on for all eternity. Just, just, just think about this. For 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 years. It will just go on and on and on and on. Isn't that great? <laughs> You're excited now, aren't you? Because this is going to be good. We'll probably get really good at the harp. I mean, I don't know. If you have eternity, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still struggling. But since we'll have forever to do this, it'll be great. Some of you see a problem with this. Right? And, and the problem with this is that um, it beats being dead. <laughs> but for some of you, being on a big white puffy cloud playing a harp forever and ever backed by even a heavenly choir has got some drawbacks to it. Am I right? And, and yet for many of us, I think this is kind of the idea that many of us have. Ahead. At least, you know, it's kind of the, the picture that we get from Culture Day about what heaven looks like. And for many of us, it's, you know, like I say, it beats being dead, but it's not something that just really gets us all fired, excited about being in heaven forever. If we're just going to be on a big white puffy cloud choir, uh, and, and some of you like choirs, so that's going to be great. But for others of you, that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, many times we've described heaven. We've done what uh, Miss Watson did to Huckleberry Finn. I don't know if y'all read Huckleberry Finn. You probably were supposed to in school, but not all of you did. Uh, but, but Huckleberry Finn, uh, he gets in trouble. And Miss Watson is getting on to Huck, and so she tells him, doesn't he want to go to heaven? And she describes heaven for him, and, and this is what Huck is thinking. It says, She went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said not by a considerable sight. I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, uh, Miss Watson didn't paint a picture of heaven that was very appealing to Huck. And many of us have had a picture of heaven that's not all that much more appealing. I remember when I was in high school art class uh, that we had these pictures of heaven and hell. And the pictures of heaven were a lot like this. And they were very serene whites and light blues and harps and angels and clouds. And, and those were the pictures of heaven that were supposed to you know, really excite people during this period of time. But the pictures of hell were very different. Uh, in hell, people were playing cards and dancing and drinking, and there were scantily clad women running all around the place. And I wasn't as spiritual in high school as I am today. So I will tell you that I struggled with which place looked better uh, to me. White, puffy cloud choir, scantily clad women running around and playing games and, and dancing. I, I don't know. One of them didn't look as good as the other. And so many of us don't have a picture of heaven that is uh, appealing, that calls us forward. And so that's why I want to just share it with you guys today. And I want us to kind of uh, maybe unrobe a little bit of the heavenly myth that some of us have. All right, kind of put away the white robe in the, choir, in the cloud and kind of see what the Bible has to say about what heaven is really like. And when we begin to look at what the Bible has to say about this, I want to tell you I'm pretty excited about what heaven is actually going to be like. And so when I, when I begin to examine this, the place I'm going to start is the place I often start with trying to figure out what God is up to, and that's in the beginning, back in Genesis chapter 1. 
In Genesis chapter 1, you guys know how this works. God is creating uh, this new place. And, and God is creating a planet, a place, for Adam and Eve to live together forever with Him. Right? I mean, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were not intended to die. They were supposed to live forever. And this, this place that God is creating is a place where they can be in fellowship with Him, with one another, and with all creation. And so God creates this earth on which we live. And it says in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 31, it says this, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. A vast virus database has been updated. All right. <laughs> it's important. You should do that. Maybe not now, but that is important. All right. All right, now, get back to what I'm saying here. All right. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Here's what we need. God creates a place for us to live with him forever, a place that we can enjoy with him, with one another. And he says after he created, he doesn't say, man, I really messed up this time. Boy, I wish I had a second chance. God looks at it and says, man, this was very good. Our greatest hint about what heaven is going to look like is from this earth on which we live. All right, that's the first thing I want you to understand. And, and we kind of all know what happened to this earth. Uh, sin came, and when sin came on the earth, uh, everything on earth was damaged by sin. Everything. That's what the Scripture says. Not just humans. Everything was damaged. And you and I, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we long for restoration. We long to be restored to a right relationship with God. We long to be restored to a right relationship with each other. And we long to be restored to a right relationship with creation. But because of sin, all that's been thrown off kelter. Everything's messed up, but it's not just you and I who long for this. In fact, when we turn to Romans chapter 8, the Scripture tells us something key, I think. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 19, it says this. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now there's a lot in that scripture right there, but the thing I want you to kind of focus on today is that all of creation is longing for for restoration. It's not just you and I that was affected by the fall. It's not just you and I that were affected by sin. The scripture says that everything on this earth has been infected by that. Not just humans, but plants, but animals, the air we breathe, the planet, everything has been damaged by sin. And all creation, you and I, and all creation with us is longing for restoration. Now we see this restoration occurring in Revelation chapter 21. Beginning in verse 1, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The scripture describes here in Revelation chapter 21 a new heaven and a new earth, and the dwelling place of God is with man. Heaven and earth become one, and the dwelling of God is now with man. And what the scripture teaches us about in Genesis is how paradise was lost. What the scripture speaks to us about in Revelations is how paradise is restored. And what God is doing is, is bringing us back to what was lost in the Garden of Eden. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and the two will be one. All right, so here's the picture I want you to get. If we're going to begin to think about heaven, our greatest hint is this earth on which we live, but this earth is fallen. Um, look at this picture right here behind me here. Now, most of us can recognize what this is, right? I mean, you can recognize that at one time that was not only a house. You can recognize the fact that it was at one time probably a very nice house that now has been damaged, it's falling apart, it's not what it once was, but you can kind of look at it and see that it once was something pretty cool. Right? Yes? All right, yeah, good. You can see that. Now, here's what I want you to get. Imagine this. 
What if the Buffalo River is a fallen down, dilapidated old shell of what it was intended to be? I mean, most of y'all have seen that. What if? What if the Colorado mountains are a dilapidated old shell of what they were intended to be? What if the coral reefs in the ocean that are so full of life and color and beauty, what if they are dilapidated old shells of what they were intended to be? What if the plains of the Serengeti, full of life and diversity and all those kinds of things, what if the plains of the Serengeti are just a dilapidated old shell of what they were intended to be? You see, this earth is like that old house. It is not what God intended for it to be. It's all been fallen. It's all been corrupt. It's all been damaged. But it gives us a hint when we look at this earth, when we look at the plains of the Serengeti, the Colorado Mountains, the Buffalo River, the coral reefs, we can see just a hint of the beauty that once existed in this place, how there was supposed to be harmony between humans and plants and animals we just get the barest hint of that based on looking at what is we can simply begin to imagine what was and it must have been incredible what if every joy on earth is just a, a, a small taste a dilapidated old shell of of what it will be in heaven could you get excited about that I mean, could heaven be a place that, that you think about and dream about if you began to believe that, that, man, the Colorado River, the Buffalo Mountains, the Serengeti, those are just, man, those are just little bitty damaged hints about the kind of place that you and I are going to spend eternity. What if there are mountains to climb and explore and adventures to have and there are plants to search for and to find, to taste and to smell and animals to search for and partner with and study and all those kinds of things? What if every month when your Heavenly Geographic magazine comes, you flip it open, and somebody's discovered a new place or a new plant or a new animal, and you just go, it just, just can't get any better. It just keeps getting better and better and better. Wouldn't that be incredible? It wouldn't that kind of be a place that you could get excited about spending eternity? You want a hint of what heaven is like? God didn't mess up the first time. God created a place where he could live with us and we could live with him. And what we experience around us is just the broken down, dilapidated old shell of what God intended for it to be. And if that's so, heaven is going to be amazing. It's going to be a place. It's not a cloud. All right? There we go. It's a place. It's not a cloud. And this earth gives us a great hint about what that place is like. And we're going to be in heaven, a physical place. We're going to be in a physical body. We're not going to be disembodied spirits floating around, which I also think is good news. The scripture tells us about that in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to get new bodies. And some of us are like, whew, that's good. I need that. We're going to get new bodies in heaven. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 3 says this. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Now, when the, when the Scripture refers to Christ's glorious body, they're talking about Christ's body after His resurrection. And the Scripture says that you and I will have bodies. In fact, in our affirmations of faith, when we, when we declare what we believe at, as Christians, we declare that we believe in the resurrection of of the body. We are not disembodied spirits floating around in heaven. We're going to have bodies, and the scripture tells us that our body is going to be like Christ's resurrected body. All right, and so since we know that our bodies can be like his resurrected body, we can kind of look in scripture and find some hints about what our bodies are going to, are going to be like. Luke chapter 24, we see after Jesus has arisen uh, uh, from the crucifixion, he appears to his disciples, and it says this beginning in verse 37 says, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of world fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. All right, you know what? Just looking here, we, we find some things about Christ's resurrected body. First off, he looked like a human being. 
He wasn't kind of an alien creature. Uh, the disciples recognized him as a human being. He was recognizable. Now, they didn't first recognize him because they were shocked and amazed, but as they heard him speak, they were able to recognize Christ. They, they remembered him in this new body. He was recognizable from who he was before. We're going to recognize one another in heaven. The disciples were able to cling to him and hold on to him. It was a physical body. One of the great pieces I see here in this passage right here is that Jesus asked them, Hey, guys, do you got anything I can eat? And they handed him a, a piece of broiled fish, and Jesus, he ate it. It's going to be eating in heaven. You know? I like that. I like that. There's going to be, and the Bible talks about the feast and the banquets and all that kind of, I mean, Jesus took and ate. Now, he ate it because he wanted to show his disciples that he wasn't a ghost, and the disciples knew that if he was just a ghost, he'd put that piece of fish in his mouth, it would fall right through to the floor. Uh, and so I wanted the disciples to say, no, it's, it's me. I'm, I'm in this physical body. And so he said, give me some fish. I'll prove to you that I'm a physical being right here. I'm not just a ghost. And so he takes the fish and he eats it. But we see that Jesus is eating and, and he can eat. And he's enjoying food in this new body that he's been given. So this incredible new body that's going to be eternally free from disease and death. And so in many ways, this body is recognizable. But in some ways, it's kind of a new and improved model. Because the scripture also tells us that Jesus just appeared to the disciples in the locked room. I'm thinking transporter. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but Jesus was just able to just materialize in the room, and I don't know what kind of new powers our bodies are going to have, but I know they're going to be glorious. They're going to make these look like Model T's, uh, and, and we're kind of, when we get our new bodies, it's going to be kind of like going from a Model T into a, into a 2020 model. And we're going to step into that new body, and it may take us a while to figure out how it works. It may take us a while to figure out what all it can do, but we're going to get into that body and go, oh, man, this is good. I mean, this is, I thought my old body was cool. I mean, I, we could run and jump and play and do all that kind of cool stuff I thought was great, and I eat and taste food, enjoy pleasures, all those kinds of things. It seemed really great, but it's nothing. That's a lowly, but now I understand what Jeff was talking about that Sunday when he said we're going to trade in a lowly body for a glorious body. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have bodies in a new place. We have physical bodies in a new place, a physical place. Uh, recognize, we're going to recognize the people that we love and that have gone before us. We're going to eat and run and experience feeling and sensation, much like we do today. Uh, Christ, is glorious body, gives us a wonderful hint about that. And in these new bodies, in this new place, we're going to experience the great mercy and justice of God. Uh, this, heaven's going to be a place of resolution. Uh, Luke chapter 6 says this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject you, your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Jesus is telling his disciples, heaven is the setting where everything gets made right. All right, that's going to happen in heaven. That's the place. Now, he's also telling his disciples that earth is not the place where everything gets made right. There's going to be injustice here. There's going to be unfairness here. He's telling his disciples, hey guys, you're going to experience some really hard times. I just want you to know that God sees everything that happens. Nothing escapes him and that you will receive a reward in heaven. And in heaven, everything is going to get made right. It's a place of mercy and justice and resolution. The blind man who never saw a rainbow or the missionary who died on the mission field and never got to raise their kids or the mother who never got to hold her child. Listen, in heaven... Everything gets made right. I don't know how that happens. Listen, I, I've sat with people through some horrendous tragedies in life. And, and I've sat with people who just experienced the, the, the horrible effects of disease and the unfairness of this world. And, and, and they've looked to me to say something good. And, and I've just sat there and cried with them at times. And, and, and I don't know how God ever makes some of this right. I don't know God, how God can ever make some of the things right that go on in our world. I simply know that He will 
make things right. And the Scripture tells us that our joy in heaven will be incomparable with everything that we've suffered here on earth. And that someday we'll stand before God and say, Man, God, you did it. You did it. I didn't think you could do it. I didn't think you could ever heal this pain. I didn't think you could ever make up for this loss. I didn't think you could ever make up for what I experienced in life. But God, you more than did it, more than I ever expected. And we will praise Him and celebrate Him and worship Him forever. Because He's going to make all things right. Someday. It's not here. It's not here, but someday in heaven, everything gets made right. People say, is, is heaven going to be fun? And I think some of us, when we think about that, we kind of betray that we've bought into a lie from our culture that says sin is fun and holiness is not. That sin is fun and, and drawing close to God is, is not uh, we, some of us have kind of bought into that. And I, I praise God that when I was in the sixth grade, I went to Brook Hill Ranch Camp in Hot Springs. It was a Christian camp there. And uh, spent the week just having a great time. I mean, we, we worshipped, we, we rode horses, we took walks, we had great times. I mean, it was just in this tremendous Christian environment with Christian people. And, man, we were just having a great time. And I remember, I was only in the sixth grade, but I can remember to this day, I can remember at the end of the, that week thinking to myself, man, I really had fun. And, and then I thought, you know what? And we didn't do any bad stuff. I mean, it really was like a revelation to me. Wow, we had fun, and we didn't do bad stuff. We didn't throw rocks at people. We didn't tear down any mailboxes. We didn't spray paint anybody's house. I mean, I wasn't a bad kid. I was a pretty good kid. But, I mean, kind of, you got, you're a kid, and you do kid things. You think certain things are fun. And I just realized at that moment, wow, this was the most tremendous experience, and I can even tell my friends about it. I mean, it was a lot of fun to be in that kind of environment. And, and a lot of us have to realize that God, knowing God, living with God, is the greatest joy of all. God gave us imagination. Nations. God gave us a longing to create. God gave us a longing to explore. I mean, God gave us bodies that can run and jump and play. God gave us the desire and the need to laugh. God gave us eyes to see and, and taste buds to taste things. God gave us uh, nerves that convey pleasure from our, from our fingers to our brains. God did all that. God did that. Because He loves you and He wants you to experience great joy in life. And heaven is absolutely going to be fun. And, and, and the most amazing, most fun thing about heaven is simply going to be this. Everything in heaven is going to cause us to look towards Him. Every, every beautiful mountain, every plant, every good joke, every time, every time we taste some new food that we've never had before, we're going to realize in heaven that every good thing comes from God. And every time that happens when we experience something great, we're just going to look up and go, God, really? I mean, really? I mean, it gets better than that? I mean, we're, I'm just amazed in everything. We're going we're gonna to realize it face to face what we now know only dimly in this life. I mean, we, we kind of get it that every good thing comes from God, but we, we struggle with doubt. We forget it sometimes. We think we do start certain things, and, and we struggle in certain ways. But in heaven, it's just going to be clear. Every beautiful thing. Every great relationship, every sunset, every sunrise, whatever it is, every plan, just gonna, we're just going to fall down and simply say, man, God, I can't believe it. And that worship that go, that's going on in heaven, it's not because we have to. It's just because we keep experiencing cool stuff in heaven, and it gets better and better every day, and we just keep falling down and say, God, I don't know how it gets any better than it did today, but now I have all eternity because time doesn't matter. It's just better and better. And so we're just praising Him all the time. Because we realize how much He loves us. That every good thing comes from Him. Could you be excited about heaven if it was like that? Man, the, the Bible just gives us little hints. It just begins to, it just, just begins to describe what it's going to be like. Mansions, uh, houses, whatever it is. It, it just, it, isn't it incredible? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. And, and yet a lot of us have described heaven as an absence of things rather than the enjoyment of all that God will create, of all that God will do, of all that we will experience there. It's going to be amazing. Longing for heaven is not just for the old and sick. Listen, the Bible tells us that we're to long for heaven. The Bible tells us we're to live for heaven. The Bible tells us we're to store up treasures in heaven. But if we're, if we're going to do that, we have to have a compelling picture 
of what heaven is like. But when we have that, it allows us to endure. It allows us to live faithfully. It inspires us to be true to our Savior when we have this picture of what comes next. There was a, a long-distance swimmer by the name of Florence Chadwick, and in 1952, she attempted to swim from the Catalina Islands to the California coast. And she swam for 15 hours uh, in this cold water. And the, and the day that she swam, it was cold and foggy, and she could barely see the boat beside her at times, but she just kept on swimming. And she swam for 15 hours until she was ready to give up. Her mom was in the boat beside her, and she told her mom that she wanted to give up, and her mom said, you're almost there. You're almost there. And, and so she tried a little bit longer to keep swimming, and finally she, she just gave up. And, and when she gave up, they pulled her into the boat, and, and when they pulled her into the boat, she discovered that she was only a half mile away from, from the coastline. When they interviewed her uh, the next day about her swim and, and talked to her, uh, she said that, she said, I could have made it if I could have just seen the coastline. If the fog just hadn't been there, if it could have been a clear day, and I just, if I could have seen the coastline, I think I could have kept going. You know, that picture that God wants to give us of heaven is just a picture of the coastline. I mean, it's just a hint. It's just, just kind of a, a beginning picture of what it's going to be like. But God shows us the coastline so that we can keep going. Because God knows that life is hard here sometimes. Things aren't fair here sometimes. God wants us to find the strength to endure. The strength to keep going. And he wants to give you a picture of heaven that's compelling, that's exciting, that makes you long for that day when you arrive on the shores of that place in a new body, a place of justice and mercy and resolution, a place of great joy, great laughter, a place where we're going to live forever, worshiping this God who we'll see face to face. That's, I think, the picture that the Bible gives to us of what heaven is like. And it's important that we, we hold on to that and that we grasp that. All right? So today, I just want to share with you a little bit and kind of give you a new picture of heaven. Next week, we're going to talk about hell. Uh, the good thing is, Scripture says, heaven's going to be a wonderful place. Uh, the bad news is the scripture says not everybody is going to go there. Many of you have ideas about heaven, uh, what that's like, or is there, a, is, there a, is there a hell, or is there a heaven, or whatever. But listen, this is kind of a, a controversial thing, and I just encourage you to come and to listen next week as we kind of dive in and see what does the scripture say uh, about this. And, and we'll try to dig into that and see that next week. Let me pray.